In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we dive into the text, we're going to be back in Colossians chapter 4. And so as we're there, if you would stand in reverence for the reading of the Word, I'm going to read what I went through last week uh, and this week's two verses. So Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 2, and we're going to read to verse 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. You may be seated. So as many of you know me, I have four children. One, Asher. Two, Evan. Three, Ada. And four, Esther. Each one of them, we tried our best to uh, name them in a way that would reflect qualities that would uh, push them to follow Christ even by the name that they were called. And of those four, today I would like to talk about Evan, my 10-year-old. I know, mouth gaping open, she has no clue. Uh, and as you uh, know, uh, this little one, when she does that, can light up a room uh, and has her daddy uh, wrapped around her little finger. But as she was born, she's number two, you know, so you feel a little more loose with the second one than you did with the first one, right? And so Amber and I had each one, and we kind of did each time a little bit different. You know, you want to add a little pizzazz, a little uh, a mystery to having children, you know. And so with Evan, we didn't specifically find out if she was going to be a boy or a girl until she was born. And so in this, we have two names picked out. We have one which is a boy name, which, having three girls afterwards, I was never able to use. So it's still in the chamber, but we're not uh, going to use it. So I'm going to share it with everyone because I don't think uh, we are going to have another child. Uh, so, but I love the name Silas Matthew. Okay, I would love to meet a Silas Matthew one day, so have a boy, use it. Come up, I can tell you the meaning behind it and why we were going to do it, okay? So, but Evan is what the girl name was, Evan Grace. And so traditionally, Evan is a boy's name, but we wanted it to be short for evangelists. One who goes and tells. And so that's where we get the Evan from. But we add her middle name in there, Evan Grace. Because what she is supposed to go and tell of is the grace of God, which is the gospel. And so as we think about that, and think about stepping into this part of evangelism, well, guess what? For her even, it doesn't matter. We can name her Evan Grace all day long. But God has to open her eyes to see her need for a Savior. 
So, as she is born into sin, she has to realize that. She has to realize what Jesus Christ has done in his perfect and sinless life, in his death, burial, and resurrection from the grave, and sending forth of his Spirit, which empowers us to desire to go and share of this grace. All of this is from God. And so we must realize this. As we talk about evangelism, you must have your eyes to be open and be a child of God to go forth and share the message that saves. You can't share the message that saves without knowing that you are saved and being saved and continuing to be saved in that sanctification process. And so as we dive into this, I am focusing on believers this morning. Non-believer, if you are out there, know that we as believers, as transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, desire to welcome you into the family. Please hear this as a love from the Father calling you to himself. So as we look at this, starting in verse 5, it says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders. And so this is him talking to believers, saying, outsiders, to outsiders, go to outsiders. And so as we think about that walking in wisdom, it took me over to Matthew 10 verse 16 when Jesus sends out the disciples two by two. When we think of walking in wisdom. And look what he says. It says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent, innocent as doves. And so as we go out and walk in wisdom towards these outsiders, we must be wise as a serpent and innocent as a dove when we think of walking in this. So what do we think when we're thinking of being wise? Right? Have you ever tried to kill a snake? Okay, I have. It's, you know, don't kill a black snake. My dad would say, never kill a black snake. They'll help you out. They'll keep the rats away from your house. But have you ever killed a snake? Well, they're hard to kill because they're trying to move. And they don't want you to get a hold of their head. So they know what's coming. They're paying attention. They're evaluating the situation that is going on around them. But as we are diagnosing the situation, as we are trying to evaluate what is wise, what to do, who do I talk to, how do I approach, right? We must not use that in a way to get the upper hand and to manipulate the situation. No, for our benefit. But to be innocent as doves knowing that we are only desiring good for them. As God opens our minds to be able to discern these situations, He is wanting us to do this in a beautiful, innocent way. And think about that. As He says, walking toward an outsider. Do you see that? Toward outsiders. So I need to be near to them. I need to approach them in the conversation, not, ugh, goodness. But isn't that what the devil tries to do? Tries to keep us at arm's length from outsiders? Okay? I'll tell you a story. This is, this is one that was really, really a blessing to me to get to see 
the devil trying to keep his believers at arm's length and God desiring to draw us close. So before we moved here, we lived in Lancaster and we lived in a trailer park. And there was a guy who would come out his back door every single night and he would let off two rounds. Bah! Bah! And I was there doing dishes one night because you would hear gunshots all the time in this setting. And I was doing dishes one night and I could see him out. And I knew this young man. I knew he had drunk, he drank alcohol all day. He was not clear in mind. I'm like, all it takes is for him not to raise his hand all the way. And boom, he's coming into my house. So I go over the next morning. I'm like, man, Rara, you can't be doing this. This is so dangerous, man. I didn't know that those two shots every night was you coming out of your door doing that. And as I approached him like that, he broke. Boom. And just started weeping. And he says, man, I am so scared to live here. And so scared that evil is going to come upon my house. I do that to try to scare people away so that they won't come in and hurt me. Think about that. If I'm not walking towards him and I automatically put a mark on him and say, you've got a gun, you're shooting it in the air, you are evil and mean and no one deserves to talk to you. Let me call the police. Get this boy arrested. But instead, approaching. And do you know what happened after that? We got to talk. And we prayed together. And he stopped letting off those rounds every single night. And he started praying for God for protection. Instead of a gun to protect him. But did you see the ploy of the devil? He didn't want us to approach him. Do you know why? Because he wants to keep him trapped in darkness. So these opportunities of evangelism, we're talking about the powers, the principalities. We have Satan fighting against God's people to delay God's plan. He cannot thwart God's plan, but he sure tries to delay it. But let's keep looking into that as we think of someone else walking in wisdom like that. Let's go back to the Old Testament and think of Joseph. Think of what happened with him when he was walking with outsiders after his brother threw him in that hole. What happened? He had favor with Potiphar whenever he was in his house. He had favor with the guard when he was put into prison. He had favor with the cupbearer and uh, the baker to hear his dreams eventually. Had uh, favor with Pharaoh. But why? Because he is walking in wisdom. It doesn't matter if he's no longer with the people. It doesn't matter. His God didn't forsake him. His God was right there with him. And he walked in wisdom not perfectly because we can't do it perfectly. But knowing that God is with us to walk in wisdom. Let's go into the next section of this uh, verse. It says, making the best use of the time. Making the best use of the time. So thinking about what you're doing. Okay? I'll give you an example of not thinking about what you're doing. 
so that we can correlate it over to thinking about what you're doing. How many of us have ever driven home from work and forgot driving home? Because we mindlessly just did the routine of going home. Guess what? You weren't thinking. You weren't being precise. You weren't being watchful, as he told us to pray. In living it out, you weren't being watchful. So think about that in correlation. So it says making the best use of your time. Going to the store to provide for your family. Instead of staying on your phone and looking down the whole entire time, looking up and seeing all these people that you could interact with and share the gospel with. People who are in that store who you never encounter on a regular basis, but instead we're in our culture, get in, get out. Man, I can't stand these people. Man, let me get to the shortest line so I don't got to talk to nobody. Tell me that's not the way that we respond. But are we making the best use of our time? Or are we telling that person that we're talking to on the phone, hey, I got to go. I need to talk to this cashier and show them respect. I need to ask them how they're doing. And we'll get into that. But think about this. Going to the store. Yesterday, I was sitting at baseball practice with a couple other parents for Asher. What did I do? Could I have stayed in my car and waited, parked far away so I don't get hit by a foul ball? Right? Everybody, parents done that, right? So, or am I there interacting with them, talking to them, finding out who they are, where they come from, do they believe in Jesus Christ? Am I using the best effort in my time? Or I don't care about anybody else on this field but my son. And I tell you what, he better get playing time. He better... Think about it. How selfishly do we go in? The rest of these 15 people that are here have no... They don't matter to me one single bit. All I care about is my son and mine alone. Guess what? I'm not making the best use of my time. Right? Standing out here in service on Wednesday night. I'm talking with members. We're greeting... I have a lady from our shelter who approaches me who says, Hey, my boyfriend is coming here. Do you have a blanket or something that he can have? And I said, Well, I can do him one better. I said, You get him here. I said, I'll take him with me and we'll go over and take him to the shelter so that he'll have the same exact thing that you have tonight. Did I take that opportunity to say, hey, by the way, I am not a nice man. But I have been transformed by Jesus Christ and he has me to care for you. Am I making the best use of my time? Well, Amber took the girls home. I've got Asher here with me. I've had a hard time getting him up out of bed in the morning. I am not taking him with me over to that shelter. I know I'm going to run into other people that I know and I don't want to have to talk to them. All I want to do is get home. Am I making the best use of my time? Think about it. Where does... Our mind goes. As we keep going in, it says, let your speech always be gracious. Be kind. I've said that a million times to my children and from here. 
Be kind. Be kind. What a fruit of the Spirit that can go such a long way. Be kind. Be compassionate towards them. Do you hear that? It says, be gracious. To be gracious. To show kindness and to be compassionate. And so I'm going to let James 3 kind of do this back and forth for us. Okay, so turn with me over to James 3. Starting in verse 2. And watch what happens here. It says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by rudders wherever the will of the pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it, bo it boasts of great things. How great a forest to set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creatures can be tamed and as has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God, our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessings and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same open, fresh, and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine? Produce figs. Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And so as we think about that, guys, James is exactly right. We cannot do this on our own. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, this tongue can be tamed. And so can the rest of our bodies. So let us be a people that are gracious. Think about this. Go over with me. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but Romans 2, 4. God's kindness will lead men to repentance. Beautiful, gracious speech will lead men to repentance. And then the next part of this verse, it says, seasoned with salt. Okay? And so as we think of what salt itself does, okay, it preserves, it purifies, and it adds flavor. Sorry, I didn't have another piece. 
All right. So, all my true Baptists say, "Amen." So, uh, <laughs> so, but as we're thinking about this, as we're being gracious, as we're being kind, what does this non-believer need? And that's what we sprinkle in the seasoning of salt. Do they need to be preserved this day? Look at the definition of preserved. It says, to keep alive, intact, and free from decay. Think about the gift that is that we can go to this dying world and share Jesus Christ with them to keep them alive. To help them not to just wither away and shrink back. But to be what they were intended to be. If salt was put on meat to preserve it, to keep it so that we could eat it later on. Right? This salt that we're giving out is to preserve these people as God in His kindness calls them to Himself and uses them for what they were created to do. But it's just not yet. Preserve them, brothers and sisters. Think about this. Purifies. Purifies them. As we go out to these outsiders and we're seasoning them with salt, They might need to repent. They're not within a church. They don't hear our public prayer of confession. They don't know that they need to turn away from their sin and turn to God. But to be there and say, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if we turn away from that sin and we turn to Christ Jesus, and we lay our lives down, He will make us a new creation. The old will pass away. Behold, the new will come. All this is from God, who was reconciling the world to Himself. I tell you, that's what happened to me at 17 years old. I was convicted of sin, and I didn't know what to do with it. Had absolutely no clue. I knew I was bad, and I knew that I needed help. But I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to go. Guys, we can be that agent to tell people where to go. Don't come to me. Don't come to Simeon. Don't come to Jack. Don't come to Jason. Come to Jesus. Because he's the one that can set you free. But boy, I bet you money. All them boys can lead you there. Just another beggar. Giving that bread. Right? Because it's not in us. It's not in our lofty speech but it's in what Christ has done. And think about that. As we think of salt, which is what you and I use it for mostly, right? And I'll use uh, Keith Doster here, so just for uh, evidence sake, do not give him French fries without salt. French fries are edible, right guys? You eat them up. But add a little bit of salt to them. Woo, you better watch out. And what about this dying world that just needs to see in God's children, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is good. He is loving. He is kind. He is gracious. I know you feel free. But my God can truly set you free. 
I know that you feel like you've been breathing and moving, but let me show you who my God is who can really set you on fire and allow you to breathe. So that you're breathing for eternity and not breathing to death. Gotta sprinkle that seasoning salt out there. And as we are doing this, think about this. This moves us into the next verse. And it says in verse 5 So that, oh, I'm still in James. Hold on just a second. I was like, that does not make sense. <laughs> All right, it says, So that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I love a good so that. I do this so that this can happen. Right? I do this so that this can happen. So that we may know how we ought to answer each person. And guys, we're dealing with non-believers here. Don't be afraid. They're not going to come at you with this deep theological question that you've been a believer for 10 years and you don't know the answer to it. No. Listen to some questions. Just by kindness and sprinkling them with salt that we could possibly be asked. Man, why are you so different? You seem just a little bit extra to me. What's going on here? You say amen all the time. What is, what is going on with you? Guess what? Open the door for me to share the gospel in being transformed by Jesus Christ and that he desires to do that with you as well. How can I be kind like you? That's what that guy in the parking lot told me in the car when I was driving him to the shelter. Man, I just... I just can't be kind like this. How in the world can I be kind? Do you know him? Jesus Christ. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's not anything special about me. It's not anything special about my brothers and sisters. It's a fruit of the Spirit. We should manifest this. Right? Here's another one. You remind me of my grandfather. Man, y'all talk the same. Y'all talk about the same stuff. I just, I just hadn't seen that since he died. Well, was your grandfather a believer in Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. That's why we sound the same. Because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have the same Father. Right there, guys. Simple questions that they respond back in kindness. Is this super duper deep? No. They are stating the obvious. Right? What does the Bible say that this world walks by? They walk by sight, not by faith. But are we being able to be seen? Are we being seen? So that what they see, God presses upon their heart to respond in faith. Because if we can see this dark and dying world. Do we not think that they can too? It's 
broken out here. They see sickness. They see everything around them has a lifespan. Something is off. As you notice on Wednesday night and on Sunday morning, uh, we are developing a strong relationship with Roto Rooter Plumbing. And so, uh, <laughs> so Chad and I are with him on Wednesday night. The boy who's uh, cleaning out our pipes has got a migraine. And Chad and I are standing there, and we're with him the whole entire time. Chad more than me. But he asked and says, hey, do you have some water? Chad and I both kind of scurry around, go try to find him some water, right? Come back. I called him this morning. Do you know what they said? Man, we're going to try to get there as fast as possible. Oh, I remember you. You the one that gave me that water. Think about that. What they remember is the kindness of someone caring that they had a migraine and didn't just say, hey, I'm paying you, boy. You better speed up. Let's go. I need it done. I need you out of here. I got this happening. Right? Or this beautiful passage of Scripture in Acts, where in this kindness, seasoning people with salt, they may say, how must I be saved? How must I be saved? And in that moment, we have the great privilege of sharing the gift of Jesus Christ. How he has died for them. How he has rose for them. And how he has ascended to heaven to intercede on their behalf. So that it is no longer their brokenness and their fallenness that they are trapped in. But that they are free because Christ has taken their sin and thrown it as far as the east is from the west. He has forgiven them past, present, and future. But don't lose heart. This sounds like a lot. But guess what? This isn't an individual task that is happening here. He is talking to the church at Colossae. He is talking to us here at Park Baptist Church. We need to go out two by two. We need to call on one another and have these things on our minds. Sharing evangelism reports. Praying for one another. Man, I just had this guy come to my house to work on my electricity. Hey, could you come over and let's tag team him? Let, let him know who we are and what we're about. Can we do this together? Because that's the scary thing of evangelism. We think we're out there alone. But God has said, no, I have given you brothers and sisters in Christ. They are with you. But most of all, I am with you. I am with you. Be encouraged, church, by the power of His Spirit. He desires for us to go forth to share and make the best use of our time for His name's sake. Pray with me. Father, You are so kind and so gracious slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. 
Lord, I pray that we would see the beauty and the gift that you are and go forth to this world sharing of the grace that you have extended to us and other believers. Lord, we pray for the lost. We pray that you, in your kindness, would open their eyes and that we would get the great privilege of becoming partakers in your mission. Lord, we know you have gifted each one of us and you have told us to go and make disciples. And Lord, so we pray that we would be a people who would be about your business. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.